Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. I struggled initially. A uh, pastor asked me to minister for him because they're on vacation. And I struggled initially because um, the very next day, I had this subject drop in my heart. And uh, I just kept saying, God, this is a youth subject. This is a youth subject. I can't talk to all these adults about all this. This is a youth subject. Well, you know, uh, Bible school students, if you remember, if we heard it once, we heard it many, many times, stay with your assignment. Yes, stay, stay with your assignment. With so if I'm preaching a youth subject to y'all, then you just kind of hang on for the ride. It's, I'm staying with my assignment. Amen. But here's the other part to that is that we all have relationships with other people. Yep. 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 All of us. All of us have relationships with other people. Yes, sir. We have degrees of relationships, right? We have our close friends, we have our family, we have our acquaintances, and we have the people that, well, <laughs> It's true. We all have relationships with other people. It's not just a youth subject. It's a people subject. And I'll tell you, there's one thing that sometimes if we haven't, really taken care with following the Holy Spirit, we will find ourselves in relationships that are accidental. Yep, yep. They just happen. Yep, that's right. They just happen. Did you know that the, the scripture is very explicit in places that we should not just have accidental friendships? Amen. We should not have those. My personality type is, is, is one that I examine things and analyze things a lot not because I'm critical of it, but just because I'm one that seeks understanding constantly. And sometimes, you know, I find things that need to change or that I think, I think need to change, you know, because, you know, I know with all things. <laughs> not really, but, <clears throat> you know, and, and so this was, a re this was an area for me that was very hard growing up was relationships and friendships. And so because I didn't know what else to do, I did what came naturally to me, which was I started to study them. I started to study friendships. I started to study relationships because I wanted to understand how do these things work. And I didn't realize it, but I was really studying people who at the time I really didn't like. God has done a work in me, just so you know. For me to even be at the place where, yeah, people are all right. I maybe still like dogs a little better, but, you know, no. Do you know what I'm saying? God has done a work in me. But, but here's the thing that happened in that process is God began to show me things about having intentional relationships. And that his plan for us is to not just be friends with people because we hang out with them at work or to not just be friends because we've grown up with people, but to have intentional relationships, intentional friendships, things done on purpose by the leading of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to show you why this is important for this era that we're in. So Acts chapter 2, we're starting verse 42. This will be our main text, and as my usual pattern is, it'll be a while before we get back to it, but at least, you know, if I don't get to it again you'll know that this was where we were headed. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. They, the believers, because it just talked about all these believers being added. So they is the ones that were just added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, God's special messengers. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their, their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I'll take a quick aside here and say that, that so they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That is not communism. It is not socialism. We did not have an early Christian commune going on. No, they were capital people. 
They were people that operated in a free market society, an ancient one, but it was still a free market society, unregulated. What was that? That was them doing what the Holy Ghost told them to do, giving with weapons of righteousness so that the needs of all God's people would be met as God led them to meet them. And then we see a man named Barnabas, and he had a field, and he sold it, and he brought it to the apostles' feet. Why? Because the Holy Spirit led him to do so. The government did not make him to do it. The church officials didn't tell him he had to do it. The Holy Ghost prompted him, and he brought it. Know this. I want, you, I want to start here, and we're going to take a minute to get back to our main text, but I, want, I need to establish a couple things here. I want you to know this. God loves you. Our pastors love you. We love you. And God desires to see you walk in every good thing that he has to offer. So I need to share a couple thoughts with you before we really get going on this. Because when we start talking about friendships, there's something in us because we as people have a need to be accepted. We have a need for community. And when you start messing with our community... However misguided we might be in being in it, when you start messing with our people, we get a problem. And that's why I want to start here and tell you, God loves you. God wants to help you. This is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of rescue. This is a message of salvation if you'll accept it. It's interesting, I think, that in the ancient Greek language, they had five words for love. We, this is something that we all know, right? Commonly accepted Christian fact. God chose the strongest of them, agape, in the scripture. But did you know that agape, it really just means brotherly affection. But it's a little more than that because it's a word that's indicative of the bond that fighting men in the same unit form amongst each other in wartime. It's that band of brothers kind of bond between people. Does that make sense? But this word, it's interesting because God deemed its meaning insufficient. Why do I say that? Because in 1 Corinthians 13, he had the Apostle Paul write a definition for it. In other words, God said, you can't come up with a word good enough, so I'm going to write the definition for you. So we could read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 like this. And I'll read it out of the message, and then I'll read this other version. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than itself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. It doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't, doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of the truth, and it puts up with anything. Trust God always, always looks for the best, never looks, looks back. Love never quits. It keeps going to the end, and it will never fail. And we quote this scripture, praise God. We all say hallelujah. And we normally quote it in this context of the role that man plays. Right? We talk about it in the context of we need to walk in love with our brethren. All true. But sometimes we forget every revelation has a man word side. And I love what Pastor Ike said, no revelation is complete until a man understands his place in it. But in trying to understand our place in it, sometimes we skip a step and we forget the God word side. We forget the God word side. There is another minister, his name's Reverend Doug Jones, and he said this. He said that it's easier to teach a subject when you teach the God side first. It's not complete until you know your place in it, but it's easier to get when you understand God's end. Because then you understand it's all on his end. He's upholding it. The promise that's attached to it, he's bringing that to pass. So then your side is just to take care of you. Your side's not to change the world. Your side is to take care of you, and God will change the world through you. See, that helps. And in 1 John 4, 8, it says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. It's that word agape again. 
So we could read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this way if we're going to talk about the God word side. God never gives up on you. God cares more for you than for himself. God is not covetous of your stuff. God is not covetous of your stuff. God don't need your money. God doesn't strut around bragging at your expense. God doesn't have a swelled head. God doesn't force himself on you. God doesn't fly off the handle at you. God is not keeping score of all your sins. Here's one. God is not joyful when you grovel. God is not joyful when you grovel. He gave his one and only son for you so that you could be a joint heir with Christ, seated in heavenly places with him. And that's why he says, come into the throne with boldness. That's why Paul said we come into the throne with boldness and access by faith. God is not joyful when you grovel. God takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. God stays with you in every situation. God always trusts you'll do the right thing. God always looks for the best in you. God never looks back to the good old days. But he keeps going, never quitting, carrying you on to a victorious end. And God will never fail you. The scripture was not written for our harm. It was written for our benefit. It was written to help us, to enlighten us, to bring us to God's way of thinking. <laughs> you know, uh, we've all heard of this, of a functional alcoholic, right? That's someone who has ingested so much alcohol that it has literally rewired their brain chemistry so that they cannot function without a certain level of alcohol in their bloodstream. And when they stop ingesting alcohol, they change. <laughs> they were once happy, and now they're less than. But here's the point. They ingested something to the point, to such saturation, it rewired how they think. Physically, changed their brain chemistry. The word of God when you ingest it in enough quantity, will rewire you. Well, you can't read too much of the Bible now, brother. That's stupid. You can't say stupid in church. Stupid. S-T-O-O-P-I-D. Stupid. I know all the youthies were waiting for me to pull that out. It's dumb because God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It will take a lifetime of study to reach out to God's thoughts. And we won't fully know them until we're with him. So you're saying the one thing that is going to train us how to think like God, the creator of all the universe, the one who parted the sea, the one who held the sun in the sky, Oh, yeah, he held the moon in the sky, too. The one who healed all those people through the ministry of Jesus, did the miracles of multiplication, was with Paul, changed the entire world through one message. That guy? That, that one? You're saying the thing that's going to train us to think like him is dumb? Stupid. <laughs> Just plain stupid. Anyway, moving right along. It's for our help. It was written to strengthen us, establish us, unify us, and build a people who would be salt, light, and display his glory in the earth. As we move forward, let's not forget the word of God was written for our benefit and that he loves us. Let's not forget that. 
Let's keep it in mind. Keep it well before us. There was a motivational speaker. I won't say who he was because it's not important. He said, show me your five closest friends and I'll show you where you'll be in five years. This man really just articulated a biblical truth. Proverbs chapter 17, or I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 12. We'll get to Proverbs 17. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 26. Proverbs 12 and verse 26. I'm teaching, but I'm still going to move fast, people. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked will lead them astray. See, he just articulated what God already knew. That if you hang around the wrong people, even if you are righteous, it will lead you astray. If you'd like a biblical proof, go look at the story of Abraham and Lot. When Lot went into Sodom, what does it say? Daily they vexed his righteous soul. There is a man that chose some very poor friends. And what happened? They vexed his righteous soul every day. To the point where, when the angels came to visit, he was perfectly fine with giving up his daughters for unclean things. He thought that was a fair trade. No, that wasn't a fair trade. He shouldn't have given up his daughters and he shouldn't have given up the angels, which he didn't. He shouldn't have done either one. But see, he was in a place of such unrighteousness. See, it led him astray. It led him astray. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Let's see what the New Testament has to say. You'll find it's remarkably similar. It's almost like the same person wrote it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. Do not be misled. In other words, you can be. We got whole millions of people trying to try to mislead us. Do not be misled. Bad company is going to corrupt good character. I want you to ask yourself a question. How did I become friends with my five closest friends. How did that happen? Now I want to ask yourself this question, now that you've answered that one. Did I bring any of my five closest friends into my life by faith? Ooh, that's a tougher one. Finally, ask yourself this question. When did I ask God if any of my five closest friends should even be my five closest friends? When did I get God's permission for this? Well, I don't need to ask God's permission. No, you don't, but you should. You should. After all, he knows you better than you know you. Too many times we build friendships by accident through shared interest, shared experience, or shared space. I first became friends with Joe because he sat next to me at work. Since we see each other every day, we just started talking. Next thing you know, our families do everything together. Shared space. Shared space. I share a space with you, so by default, I have to be friends with you. I used to be a hiring manager <clears throat> for a company, and I, I helped do some of the recruiting and hiring. And one of the questions that we asked the, the team managers, because I, I was the hiring manager in the headquarters office, but then we had field technicians that went out, and we had managers of those teams. And one of the things that we had the managers of those teams ask these employees was, what are your hobbies? Because we wanted to know, can you stand to be around each other for 10, 12 hours a day? Because sometimes that was our work week. Because if you can't stand to be around this person, then we've got a dysfunctional team already. 
And we don't need that out when we're trying to get work done. We don't need a bunch of drama. So let's cut down on the drama and just ask right now, can you even stand to be around this guy? And if the answer was no, we didn't hire him. See, there's a thing with shared space. Just being in proximity to each other for long periods of time will cause you to build a relationship. Unless you're on guard. How about this one? I met Jim through fantasy football. And since we're both Pats fans, we started talking, and eventually our families started watching all the games together. Sorry, Pats fans. I just pick on you today. I don't really care. I don't watch football. I know. God forbid I'm American. I don't watch football. What's wrong with me? I just don't. I just don't. That's a shared interest. See, they shared an interest over football and fantasy football and games and da-da-da-da-da-da. And because they shared that interest, they started talking and fellowshipping over that interest, you know. Right? Accidental friendship. Didn't intend on it. You just found out, hey, they like the same thing I do. How about this one? I basically grew up with Sally. She lived a couple of farms over, and she's more like a sister than a friend. I've known her all my life. Shared experience. See, we form relationships based on shared space, shared interest, or shared experience. And if we're not careful, those things will cause us to form an accidental friendship. It just happened. Sometimes those are very rich, very rewarding relationships. But it's kind of like playing the lottery. Right? Slightly better odds. Because there's a lot more people to choose from. But really, you're kind of playing the friendship lottery when you do that. But how many of us, we go through life with nary a thought. It doesn't even enter into our mind that, wait a minute, God, we all say, oh yeah, there's a spouse for us, right? We all say that. There's a spouse. God's got somebody for me. Yes, he does. I just, yes. Stop arguing about it. Yes. Yes, he does. I hear you. Yes. Don't give up hope. We all know this about our, our spouse, right? But the thing is, is sometimes we don't apply that same to our friendships. Because before we get too far, your spouse is nothing more than your closest They are so close of a friend that you ask them, fellas, to share, your, share their life with you. They're so close of a friend, ladies, that when he asked you, you said, yes. So if we're going to apply this to our highest level of relationship, why do we not apply it to lower levels of relationship? The more space, interest, and experience we share with a person, the easier it is to form a friendship. But the scriptures, as I've said, they warn us to guard ourselves. We're not just to let any person into our lives because we share space, interest, or experience with them. Just because we breathe the same air is not permission to have an inflow into my life. The things that form who we are as people are ideas. These thoughts that come to us that we consider and turn over in our minds. How do those thoughts come to us? What we watch, what we read, and what we listen to. How do those things get into our life? Other people. I just read this great book. You need to read it. What you read. I just had this great conversation with this other person. Let me share what we talked about. What you listen to? There's this really great show. It's called The Hunted. You need to watch it. What you watch? How did all of those things come into your life? Someone told you about it. 
Those things work positively too, right? Right? There's a Holy Ghost meeting going on and Pastor Nancy's going to be there and you got to get there. I read it on the internet. Who put it on the internet? Another person. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, and we're going to go here. Now, I know this may seem like a tangent, but it's not. I'll explain how it's not. You've got to love me if you want to go to heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. <laughs> so many Christians sometimes... Now, now, don't get me wrong. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <clears throat> so when you're operating in the Spirit and by the power of the Spirit, things that are hard are easy. But there are... <laughs> I hear Christians say this sometimes... I hear teenagers say this sometimes. It's just so hard. Because narrow is the way. Narrow is, it just said. Narrow is the way. And the road is difficult. Now, praise God, in the difficulty, we have a comforter. We got a helper. We got a four-barrel carburetor to put us over. And his name is the Holy Ghost, our advocate. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Yes. Amen. See, we got help. We got help. But he told us, just like in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world, you will have. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say might. He said, you can slide past it if you try. He said, you will have tribulation. But, but that means the statement's not complete. Take heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Anyway, just a little aside. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. I'm going to read this in the message. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced even in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff. Even though crowds of people do. The way to life to God is vigorous and requires total attention. Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot, dripping with practice sincerity. Chances are they're out to rip you off. Don't be impressed with charisma. Look for character. Look for character. Character. What's he talking about? Friendships relationships because stuff don't got no charisma I use bad grammar on purpose much to my mother's vexation she did teach me English stuff doesn't have charisma people do stuff doesn't have character it takes on the character of the person that owns it people have character Look for character. In other words, there's a million people that will accept you. But there's only a small number that God says, these are your people. These are your people. There's a multitude, I mean just a multitude, of people that will accept you. Acceptance is really a dime a dozen. For a time, though, it's only really a temporary acceptance until they get to know you. The reality is, is that most people will only accept you as long as you live a life in conformity to their code or to their way of thinking or to their idea. As long as you stay conforming, they'll be your friend. In case you didn't know, I don't care if you don't like it. Because I've already tried to live a life of conformity. I got the t-shirt and I ain't going back. 
Your dislike does not offend me. So as long as you live a life of conformity, people will stay friends with you. They'll accept you. As long as you don't start that business. As long as you don't move to that city. As long as you don't go into the ministry. As long as you don't go to that church. As long as you don't listen to that preacher. As long as you don't listen to that music. As long as you don't read Dad Hagen books. As long as you don't play Pastor Jay in your car. You want to know how you're living a life of conformity? When that person gets in, do you turn Pastor Jay off? Yep, come on. That's it. Well, I don't want to offend him. Maybe you should. Yeah, come on. Come on. Should. That's right. Amen. Come on. Yep. Why? Be a lot less painful of a process to get him out of your life. <laughs> They'll remove themselves instead of you having to do it. <laughs> Let me ask you a few questions to think about. Man, we're running out of time. When you spend time with friends, do you leave feeling exhausted, frustrated, depressed, angry, or all of the above? I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for you. you got to answer this question yourself. And you know the reason that we laugh is because immediately we all think of, oh, yeah. Yep. Last Thursday. Do you find your faith in God weakening when you spend time around yo peeps? Are you are people around you? Attempting to separate you from godly authority, such as your pastor or your boss or your spouse, through strife, deceit, manipulation, or emotional pressure. Well, last Tuesday, I was on the phone. See? That's why, you know. If they're doing that, it tells you something. How about this one? When you communicate revelation that you have, praise God for what he's done in your life, or begin obtaining the promises of God by faith, are you met with negative, demeaning, or even defaming responses from the people around you? If the answer to any of these questions is a yes... Or an, I don't want to answer. <laughs> or if these questions make you a little uncomfortable, then you really should examine the relationships in your life and ask God about making some changes. Because that is not God's best for you. God desires that the relationships in your life bring peace. and stability and joy and gladness and refreshing. That when you leave the company of that person, that you're like, oh, I'm glad I went. Not, well, that's over. (laughs) I've been there. Looking forward to going out to dinner with these people for all month. And you get in it and you're like, oh yeah, this is why we don't do this that often. I remember now. Rangy dingy. Hey, we made it back. Let's go back to our main text. Acts chapter 2. 
It was touch and go for a minute, but we made it. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. I just want to read it again, and then we're going to continue on with this thought. Because I need to show you why this is important. Yeah. This is a huge issue. This doesn't just affect your life. This affects this era. This affects this local church. This affects J. Eberly Ministries, Dufresne Ministries. This affects the move of God in the earth today. Huh? Like my son says, huh? What do you say, Daddy? Dude, look me in the eyes. <laughs> Earth to Jew. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Fellowship and relationship are not the same word. They are not the same word. The church world today uses words like love and relationship, and they've robbed them of their biblical meaning. Relationship and fellowship are not equal. That's right. They're not the same. That's right. Fellowship is, yes, a type of relationship, but you can't, change, you can't use these words interchangeable. They are not synonyms. Teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. This is a group of people that are in an association. They are together. These are the kinds of friendships. The, the early church at this stage was built of people with right friendships. And what was the commonality of these friendships? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The King James says they, abode, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. And as a result, look what happened. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. Why? They honored the ministers of God and God was free to move through them. Amen. Why? They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine and fellowship over it. Amen. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. There was no lack in the company. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They liked each other well enough to talk every day. I've had close friends before that you really can't call close friends. I mean, for lack of having other friends, you maybe call them close friends. But you don't really like them enough to talk to them every day. Some of that's my personality. I'm okay being in a room by myself in the quiet. That doesn't bother me. My wife will tell you. She's found me. She's what are you doing? I'm sitting here. Why? I don't know. I like it. No way. And she loves me so much, she just comes over and gives me a kiss. She says, okay. Because she's so sweet. She loves me so much. She loves me enough to stay with me anyway. If we're going to be in awe at the many signs and wonders, if we're going to enjoy the favor of all the people, if there's going to be no lack in our company, if we're going to have the Lord add to our number daily those who are being saved, there's some things that we have to do. There's some criteria for friendships we have to pay attention to. Now, before I continue, I'm going to add this thought because pastor said this, businesses, 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 right? So I'm going to add a thought for you. John D. Rockefeller, who, by the way, was a Christian man. The more I've studied about his life, the more I am shocked at how God moved supernaturally for him. At one time, he thought he was called to the ministry to be a Baptist preacher. The man funded more Christian universities and schools than you can even name. And he is mega, was mega wealthy. Changed the entire definition, really, of what wealth is in America. And let me tell you what, that man was a believer. He believed in the word of God. Did he do everything perfect? No, he's a man. And he wasn't a minister, he's a businessman. And he figured out what his calling was and he stuck with it. But I'm just, I'm saying that because I don't just quote people, I don't give you their name unless there's a reason why. 
See, the world has vilified him because he was a Christian that knew how to handle abundance. John D. Rockefeller said this, a friendship founded on business is better than a business founded on friendship. As you follow the Holy Spirit's promptings into business, because some of us are, right? Business is business is business. Some of us are following these promptings. As you follow the Holy Ghost promptings into business and abundance, don't go into business with someone that wouldn't pass the character test you'd expect of a friend. Yes. 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 If you expect your friend to pass a character test, yep. Yep. right? Because how many of us are running out and being best friends with the office gossip? No, we're not stupid. We're not ding We're not going to be friends with people that tell our business all over the world. But do you know how many people will get in a business partnership with someone like that? Well, they've got the, all these real estate holdings. I need the connection. No, you don't. You need God. God can bring you somebody that's got better connections, better quality business with better character. And don't marry them either. Anyway, that's free. See, don't go, we already said it. Don't go dating somebody. Why people do this, I don't know. They get desperate, I guess. Don't go dating a person that wouldn't pass the character test that you expect of your closest friend. Because they will be your closest friend. So what are the scriptural guidelines for the company we keep? In 15 minutes, I have to give you the rest of this message. My introduction is over. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Redeem the time, O oh Lord. Galatians 6 and verse 10. We've heard this quoted recently, but I think it's good to know where it is. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. The message translation says, right now. See, we sing that song, right now. You believe. And we're all happy about having a miracle, but what about you being someone else's miracle right now? What about you write the check to pay the person's house payment? Because they can't, and they're believing God for the miracle. And I have no idea why God told me to write this check for $653.89. It's a very specific amount. It's very weird. I need to have a meeting with pastor because I got this weird amount I'm supposed to write a check for. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I'm going to say. Write it. And give it to who you're supposed to give it to. That's $653.89. And you give it to that person, and they light up like Christmas. And they go, right now, if you believe. Let me just tell you. They was coming to take my house today. But I go to the bank, and now I don't have to move. And I can say, my God came through mightily for me. Why? Because you're somebody else's miracle. Just thought I'd give you a little context. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, are you looking for the Holy Spirit to tell you what to do? Are you looking? Holy Ghost, tell me. I'm ready, Holy Ghost. You tell me. You tell me. I'm on go. I'm on go. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Whatever you say. It's been a couple days, Holy Ghost. You haven't told me to do something. You haven't told me to give any money away. It's been a couple days. You haven't told me to lay hands on anybody. It's a couple days. Holy Ghost, am I doing something wrong? Why aren't you talking to me? Are you actively looking? Are you trying to find those opportunities? When you hear of something, are you going, Holy Ghost, is that me? Is that me? Am I supposed to do that? Every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Our first and closest relationship should be the people that are a part of the household of faith. 
The people that are closest to us, that we work to benefit the most, should be in the community of faith. We must all be extremely cautious about having close relationships with people who are not believers. If they're not a believer, you got to be real careful. Well, I believe in relational ministry and being friends with the heathen to win them to Christ. That's not fellowship, that's ministry. That is one way, you to them. And you have to guard your life. You have to build a brick wall so that their junk doesn't get in you. Because I'll tell you what's happened in the body of Christ since they started practicing relational soul winning. They've become carnal. You don't have to take my word for it. Just go look. We got the internet. They tell everybody's business anyway. Go look. You'll see it's true. Why? Because too many Christians were not stable enough. They were not founded enough in the word. And they let the world get in them instead of bringing the world into the church. That's why I think the video that I was talking about at the very beginning, I think is a bunch of hogwash. Because let me tell you what, if you're not strong enough in faith to witness to somebody through personal evangelism yet, and some of us aren't, do you know what I'm saying? We have to examine ourselves. Examine yourself and see if you be in the faith. That doesn't just apply if whether you're in or out. That applies to what degree in the faith are you? Be actively talking with God about your relationship with Him. And if He says, no, you're not ready yet. Bring them to church so that they can get around somebody who is ready. Don't just tell Miss Ann, Miss Ann, can you call my friend? No, you call your friend. You invite them to church. You bring them here. And then Miss Ann and I'll talk to them. Yes, invite people to church. Please do. My goodness, the internet. Anyway. <clears throat> Because, see, when you, when you are ha having a relationship with people, when you're having fellowship with people, it's two-way. There's a give and a take. There's, there's a giving and a receiving. And that giving and receiving is supposed to mutually strengthen. That's why Paul said, I long to see your face that I may impart some gift for the strengthening of you and me. And if you read that scripture, that's what it says. Yes, See, Paul was looking to be strengthened yes. because he had fellowship with those believers. Yes. So it wasn't just Paul strengthening them. They were bringing a supply back to him. Yes. And that's the way your relationships, your closest relationships in life should be that way. Yes. Is that you're providing a supply to them. Yes. They supply a, something back to you. Yes. And then we are all strengthened as iron sharpens iron. Yes. We're all sharpening one another because it's two-way. But see, when you're in relationships with people that aren't believers, that can't be two-way. Because there's darkness in them, there's light in you. All right, I'm skipping to the end. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't got enough time to talk about all. So let's get the high points. Well, you have to defend yourself. You have to defend yourself. You know what they say when, when you are, if you're going out to rescue a drowning person? Do you know what they tell you? One of the very first things they tell you in rescue school. Wait till they stop. But they've drowned then. No, they haven't. They just passed out. Wait till they stop struggling. Why? Because you cannot fight them and rescue them at the same time. We as believers would be a lot more effective if we waited until they stopped struggling. Wait until they stop kicking and fighting. Then go rescue them. They've hit rock bottom. All right, now we can lift them up. 
But until then, if you go out there and you try to rescue them, they're just going to elbow you in the face. They're going to punch you. They're going to kick you. They're going to be pulling you down into the water with them. Why? Because they're doing anything they can to get out of the water. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be, in verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Really, being unequally yoked describes any kinds of relationship. In modern terms, we might say it as a close friendship. I like the Amplified Bible. It says, don't make a mismated alliance. Don't make a mismated alliance. There's five words in this passage that describe fellowship, that describe a close friendship. One is fellowship, to have in common a partnership or to have a share in something like purchasing stock in a company. Communion, it's another word for fellowship. It's a share with someone in something a partnership or a participation together, a joint venture. Concord, which means harmony or agreement. Part, which is to have in common or participate together. It also indicates having a province in or owning property or partaking in something like a meal. You could also say it like this, like having a part in a theatrical production. You have a role that you play in accomplishing a greater whole. An agreement. Now, this word agreement is an interesting word. I'm not meaning to spend more time on it. It's just interesting enough that I want to call your attention to it. Because it doesn't just mean we both say yes. It literally means casting the same vote. To cast the same vote as. Remember, you're in the Ecclesia. That's another word for Senate. What vote are you casting? What vote are you casting? Are you casting a vote for the move of God? Or have you spent too much time with the wrong people? And you're casting a vote for just, I need some help. See, there's a lot of problems in life that we could avoid, completely avoid, if we just surround ourselves with the right people. Do you know how much drama you will not have if you surround yourself with the right people? Do you know how much more energy you will have How's having the right friends going to give me more energy? Because drama is draining. Yes. So true. So true. Yes. Drama is draining. Yes, it is. Yep. Amen. And if you're not drained because there's all the drama, you have more energy. In fact, if you have the right friends long enough, you might even start to like yourself. Because you're not tired and grumpy all the time. And you don't have people enticing you to make wrong decisions. So you're happy with the decisions you're making. Just saying. Do you know your relationship with your pastor should include all five of these words? You should have fellowship with your pastor. He should have a supply into your life. You should have a supply into his. That doesn't mean your buddies. You should have a communion or a share in the work with your pastor. 
You should have a concord or be in harmony or agreement. A concord is also another word for a contract. A synonym for concord is an accord. We struck an accord or a verbal agreement. You should have a part with your pastor in the great production of the work of God. Here's the most important one. You should cast the same vote as your pastor. I'm not talking politics. In the spirit, you should cast the same vote. I don't have any time to give you a lot of ways to troubleshoot your friendships, which I would love to do, because there's concrete steps that you can take to see where your friends are. And here's the best part. No Facebook posts, no social media, no gossip, no manipulation or emotional games needed. You simply just need to shut your mouth and watch. Well, that's easy. Most things in God are. I'll just say, I'll say it simply like this. Just keep your mouth closed and watch the people around you for character. Do they operate in godly character? If they do not, they should not be in your life. Well, people are growing and we need to give them a chance. Ministry, not fellowship. Can they grow to the point where they are a person of fellowship? Yes. Is it your job to get them there? No. Well, who's going to get them there? Their pastor. Well, we got to help people where they are. If they won't get in church, you can't help them. That's right. That's right. Amen. Yes, sir. That is so true. Come on. I yell for effect and emphasis, not because I'm angry. Because the one place where there is help is the local church. And if they won't come and sit under the ministry of a pastor. I'm going to say this before we leave. We're, We're getting there. Do not confuse reaching out to the lost. Actually, let me rephrase that. Do not confuse rescuing the lost with reaching out to the offended. Don't confuse that. They're offended. Stop it. Invest your energy in rescuing someone that needs Jesus. Well, who's going to help the offended? Their pastor. Well, they won't listen to him. Exactly. And if they won't listen to him... Sister, they ain't going to listen to you neither. All that's going to happen is they're going to suck you down that miry pipe with them. The body of Christ gets so preoccupied with moving furniture around a burning house. I want to bring them into this church. Or I want them in. You're reaching out to the offended. And the whole time, the lost are drowning. Stop it. Well, somebody's got to love them. God and their pastor love them. And the best way for you to love them is let their pastor reach out to them. And let the Holy Ghost... They're saved. They're believers. They got the Holy Ghost on the inside of them. If you're going to do something, pray the Ephesians prayers for them. Well, that's rough. Well, they made a choice. They made a choice. They made a choice. They're free will moral agents just like you are. Now, I'm not saying be mean to them. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm being dramatic for effect for your attention. I want your attention in this. Because it's important. It's important. We waste too much energy reaching in the wrong direction. Whereas if we invested all of our energy in reaching God's direction, we'll go a lot farther. 
There's a real fun game we play in youth. And I, it's, everybody grabs hands. And there's a garbage can in the middle. It's a plastic garbage can because this game gets rough. <laughs> and the whole goal is to not touch the garbage can. But the way that you win is you force other people to touch it, and they have to leave the circle. Now, you can just imagine that nobody's pulling the same direction in this game. Unless you happen to be married, and you're both really competitive. And you know how to walk in unity until it's just the two of you. We're good at this game. <laughs> but here's the thing. Sometimes that's what we do in church. Yeah. Everybody's pulling all these different directions. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody has cast a vote to say yes with their pastor. Come on. Come on. Because we all have our reason. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter what the reason is. We just all have it. Yeah. Yeah. But if we cast that vote to say yes, then we all start pulling in the same direction. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one area where we just, you know, I, and, and it's been said for years that Christians like to shoot their wounded. And sometimes that is true. That's true. But, but the reality of the situation is, is that there's a difference between somebody who is hurting, somebody who really needs encouragement from the brethren, and a person who is offended at something that was sent. Because, see, the person that's offended and has left or is doing some crazy program, they have had chance after chance after chance. How do we get on all this? Anyway, they've had chance after chance after chance after chance of people already reaching out to them because they're wounded. And I've kind of come to the conclusion it's the offended people that say the wounded are being shot. I'm trying to talk about your relationships. Because if you're in a relationship, a close relationship with someone that's offended, that offense yep. will get in you. Yep. That's right. That's you right. will carry someone else's battle flag. Yes. It's yes. not even your grievance. No. No. It's not even your deal. You really didn't care to start with. But because they just kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. And talking about it. Well, gosh darn it, we're going to do something about this. What just happened? That offense just went... Down on the inside of you. That's right. That's right. And how and it started good. It started with a good motive. I want to reach out and help you and whatever. But the thing that you have to realize is that the pastor has been reaching out. They've been reaching out in more ways than you can possibly. I don't even know about a situation that's going on. This is all by the Holy Ghost. This just they are reaching they have been reaching out in more ways than you can even imagine. There has been things go out, there's been things said, phone calls made, even when people didn't want it. You know what I'm saying? There's been so much invested in, in reaching out to this person or these people, whatever it is. I don't even know who I'm talking about. What if, instead of all that labor invested that direction, we'd have all put on some life vests, got in the helicopter of the Holy Ghost, and went out looking for some people that was really drowning. What if we'd have went and looked for some genuine sinners and sat them in the sinner section? Let's not be preoccupied. Let's not be preoccupied with the wrong... See, the devil loves to get people all preoccupied with the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. And some of it is, is we have, sometimes we have close relationships with these people. That they make these decisions and these things happen. And we see it all. We have a ringside seat. Yeah. 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 But we have to be examining our relationships and actively seeing, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Something's happening. Yeah. And I'm trying to help, but it, it's not... Suddenly, what was fellowship is now, there's something blocking my supply getting to this person. Just like when I change microphones. You got to you gotta go, know when to go to a different flow. It's not that I didn't like this microphone. It was very nice. I loved it. It was great. But the supply wasn't there. I had to get something that was the supply with. 
So I have to be, you have to be in communication with the Holy Ghost to know. Okay, wait a minute. There's, there's a situation going down there. I need to let that happen. God, where's, where's the supply? Where's the supply? Where's the supply? Oh, well, it's with Jim. Hey, Jim, we haven't talked in a long time. How's it going? And if you're a lady, your supply will be with Sally, not Jim. Just saying. Hey, Sally, we haven't talked in a long time. Hey, you want to go get your hair did or something? You know, whatever ladies do. Us dudes, we, you know, go shoot guns and roll coal. You know what I'm saying? Anyway. Some of you are going, what did he just say? It's all right. Don't worry about it. Father God, we just thank you for this service today. Father God, we just trust the things that needed to be said were said. The utterance that needed to be get out was gotten out, Father God. Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that your plan is accomplished. Thank you, Father, that you are so wise to accomplish your purpose in a way that helps and builds up and strengthens us. Oh, Father, thank you that you are so merciful to bring us our answers, even when sometimes we maybe don't want them. But Father, thank you that your mercy is always working on our behalf, abounding towards us, that great is your mercy.